Um, today we're really spending most of our time on sepsis. I do have a couple slides that review, you know, all the different kinds of shock, but we've already covered, I'll show you, we've already covered most of them, um, whether you knew it or not. So do you guys recognize most of these kinds of shock? Well, cardiogenic shock we already did. It's also known as acute heart failure. So we already did cardiogenic shock. What's the treatment for that? Initro, you forgot already. Initro, diuretics, preload reducers. Hypovolemic shock we will talk about during ER, but that's just basically where you've had a massive amount of blood loss um, and when you go into hypovolemic shock. Then there are these two different words, um, which mean, they all mean shock. What do you think is in common with all these things? What does shock have in common? What does shock mean? Not enough perfusion. Low blood pressure. Basically, as soon as you have a low blood pressure, you could be considered in shock, and it could be any number of reasons. But everything that these all have in common is low blood pressure. With acute heart failure and cardiogenic shock, you got a low blood pressure. With hypovolemic shock, you got a low blood pressure. With obstructive shock, you've got a low blood pressure. With distributive shock, you've got a low blood pressure. They're all, shock is another word for just low blood pressure. And you have to know the reason why you're having a low blood pressure. Is it because your heart's not working? Is it because your fluid is missing from the body? Is it because blood cannot get through to the heart? And that one's called obstructive. And we kind of talked about all these different um, cardiac tamponade, if the heart's so squeezed it can't pump. Um, tension pneumo, if the heart's so pushed to the side and all the blood vessels are pushed to the side. This is a very, very large pneumothorax. We'll talk about those a little next week in ER as well. Pulmonary embolism, blood can't get through the pulmonary vasculature to the heart. So basically, there's something obstructing blood flow to the heart. Gives you obstructive shock. And then distributive shock is that your vascular system is super dilated, and that's what lowers your blood pressure. So you can see we have septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and neurogenic shock. Anaphylactic shock you talked about in block two, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of covered that. Hey, low blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and then neurogenic shock we will talk about in the neuro lecture. So we, I'm going to spend today on sepsis. But really, everything that all these shocks have in common is low blood pressure. So if somebody comes to you and they say they have obstructive shock, you know it's one of those three <coughs> things. Something is blocking blood flow from getting through the heart and out to the body. And then distributive shock are the ones where we dilate out. Why do we dilate out in anaphylactic shock? Why does your blood pressure drop so much? Do you remember? Yes, we're having an immune reaction, and antibodies cause our blood vessels to dilate. That's what happens when we go into anaphylactic shock, is our, these antibodies are making our blood vessels dilate. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that your throat is closing up, and your I mean, that's deoxygenation, but the shock comes from this vasodilation calls for antibodies, which is very similar to septic shock. So let's talk about all these different ones. So no matter what kind of shock you're in, there are four stages. You will need to know this slide, the four stages of shock. Initial stage, no symptoms. Just means something is happening. Either the obstruction is occurring, the vessels are dilating, something is happening under there, the heart is failing, something is happening but we don't see symptoms yet. So you can imagine we go through this one pretty fast. It's not clinically apparent. Then we have compensatory stage, which means our systems are trying to fix the problem. So in cardiogenic shock, what do we do to help try to fix the problem? Well, no, what did your heart, what did your body do? Before we're involved, how do you know that you're going into cardiogenic shock? Or how do you, re how does this show up on your patient? They get tachycardic. They have an increased respiratory rate. Most of these shocks have the same compensatory systems. The heart rate goes up and the respiratory rate goes up because we're trying to tell the heart to push things around. Push around, we got a low blood pressure. Let's try to fix things. So the heart rate goes up, the respiratory rate goes up. And as you have decreased perfusion, your body starts to make lactate because whenever we don't have enough oxygen to our muscles, and our body and our organ systems, it will get energy the most, any way it can, in the least effective ways, getting it through lactic acid production. 
So you may see this lactate go up. So you can have your lactate go up in cardiogenic shock. You can have your lactate go up in, in anaphylactic shock. You can have your lactate go up with any, with cardiac tamponade, with anything. It just means that when your lactate is going up, for some reason your organs and your um, tissues are not getting enough oxygen. And so they're making energy another way. We usually make energy with oxygen, but they're making it another way. So this is where our blood, our body's trying to fix it. Heart rate's going up, respiratory rate's going up, and we're starting to make some lactate. That's just a sign that, hey, the body's trying to fix things. Then we go into a stage where things aren't working so much anymore. So in the compensatory stage, our blood pressure may be okay. Because what does the body do if your vessels start to dilate? It's going to try and constrict them. So in the compensatory phase, you may have a normal blood pressure. You could still be in shock, or you're getting to shock, but you're, comp you're, you're compensating. Your systems are all working to fix the problem. And the problem is low blood pressure. So we're having something that causes low blood pressure, but we're fixing it. Here in this progressive stage, all these compensatory muscles systems start to get worn out. So what do you think you see in the progressive stage? If we are basically not perfusing to our body, and we have an increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, lactic production, vasoconstriction, trying to keep our blood pressure normal, what do we see when that starts to fall apart? We start to see hypoxia, we start to see low blood pressure, we start to see an increase in our lactic acid, like we start to see that like show up, it's like, wow, you've got a higher lactic acid. All these things are starting to not work. So now we're having signs and symptoms that are much more apparent. And then in the irreversible stage, we also call this the multiple organ system dysfunction stage. Irreversible means that if we, try to pe we try to pull people out of this. We can pull people out of it. And they call it irreversible because things are going really, really bad. And if we do not act quickly, we will pull them out of it. But it, we have pulled people out of the irreversible stage, so I don't know if they're going to rename it. But basically, large-scale cell death throughout the body, so we have multiple organs in failure. Um, we have hypotension that does not improve. We basically have our patient is staying low blood pressure. We can't even help. Everything we do isn't working. Even our medical interventions aren't working. No longer do their compensatory systems don't work. Even the stuff that we're trying to throw at them doesn't work. And um, there's very high mortality in the irreversible stage. So you can imagine these are our worsening symptoms. So initial stage, compensatory stage, no changes in vital signs or slight changes in vital signs. Progressive stage is where we're like, ooh, there's a problem. And then irreversible stage is like, oh, wow, we're really in a problem. If you've been to a critical care clinical, you've probably seen many, many people in stage three and four. So here are all your cues. If you are in initial or compensatory phase, you will start to see increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, maybe your patient's tired easily, and slightly elevated lactic acid levels. That just means, hey, your body's trying to do something. You're sick. Maybe this looks like the flu, don't you think? Any kind of massive illness, isn't this the same thing? This could be any number of reasons. They're very vague causes. But if we do not intervene, what are we going to end up doing? Getting worse. So if you have a patient that is tachycardic, tachypneic, tired, and they don't rest and fix the problem or get over the problem, they could get worse. So the worsening stage is the progressive or irreversible stage. Your blood pressure goes less than 90. And this is where we start talking about the mean arterial pressure. I told you you didn't need to memorize it for a test. The only thing you need to know about a mean arterial pressure is we need at least a mean arterial pressure of 60 to perfuse our brain. So the mean arterial press, uh, pressure is a number that is a calculation. It's some kind of magic systolic over diastolic times three or something, I don't know. You can memorize the formula if you want, but I'm not going to make you calculate it. How do we find the mean arterial pressure on a patient? I don't know that formula. How do I find it? 
It's in parentheses next to your blood pressure. Most automatic blood pressure machines tell you your mean arterial pressure in parentheses next to the blood pressure. So if you have 120 over 80 with a little parentheses next to it that says 60 something, that's your mean arterial pressure. I mean, you can do the calculation if you want to, but most electronic blood pressure readers do the calculation for you and present it in parentheses next to the blood pressure. So you'll see your blood pressure and then parentheses. So whenever you see the parentheses next to your blood pressure, that's your mean arterial pressure. And you want it to be greater than 60 because that means that we are perfusing the brain. And so that's where when you get into critical care, you've probably seen titrate orders to a map or you want to keep something to a map. They don't care what your systolic and diastolic are. They just care what your mean arterial pressure is because that is perfusion to your vital organs. So you need that pressure to perfuse your vital organs. So when your blood pressure starts going low and we give you fluids and it comes back up, we consider that progressive. It's responding to our therapy. If your blood pressure goes low and we give a bunch of fluid and it doesn't help, we consider that you're getting into the irreversible stage. And I will have a bunch more slides because as we go through sepsis, sepsis is a beautiful picture of us going through the stages of shock. Anaphylaxis, we fly through these stages of shock really fast and get to this low blood pressure stage pretty quickly. In hemorrhagic shock, we fly through these stages really fast and end up with a low blood pressure really fast. Like you don't hardly even see some of these compensatory phases. You could be in those phases for five minutes before you end up in there. So it just really depends on how long the, the, um, it takes. And if you go into cardiac tamponade, you may fly through all those phases really quick before you end up in progressive or irreversible stage. Um, but this is basically saying that things aren't getting better. Pale, dusky skin, diminished pulses, cap refill. You think, hey, these were all the signs and symptoms I memorized for acute heart failure, right? Yes, because it's decreased perfusion. Anything that causes decreased perfusion and a low blood pressure is considered shock. Okay. You just have to figure out the cause of it, and that's how we name it. But anytime you have a low blood pressure and hypoxia or low blood pressure and any issues with perfusion, we're going to call it some kind of shock. But it could be anaphylaxis, could be hemorrhagic, could be cardiac, could be obstructive, could be sepsis, could be anything. Shock is not... A ter a, it's a very general term. It just means you have a low blood pressure, low perfusion. The cause is what we name it. Um, so you've probably studied all these signs and symptoms already. And then when we get into multi-system organ failure, we already have patients that are in this. Our renal failure patients who are now in heart failure. Our heart failure patients that are now getting hypoxic and getting pulmonary edema and now having hepatosplenomegaly. They're in a level of progressive shock. They sit there in that compensatory phase. And all it takes is one illness. So let's say you have a heart failure patient, heart failure and COPD. This patient is living in compensatory shock. They live there. They live and exist in compensatory shock. And when their system gets tired, they fall right into progressive. They come into the hospital with hypoxia, low blood pressure, and we give them fluids and send them up to the unit for antibiotics. They constantly are falling in between these systems. So shock is not just a one-time event. Sometimes if you have multiple systems in failure, you're already sitting right in there in that compensatory phase. Um, how many patients in a critical care clinical have already had a patient in MODS? Pretty much, if you're in the ICU, you probably got MODS. You have a patient that um, went into respiratory failure and is on a ventilator. Bam, the system counts as failure. Maybe they went into respiratory failure because they had a heart attack. Bam, you're in MODS. More than two systems in failure calls you MODS. Multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Um, when this is combined with a low blood pressure, you're considered an irreversible stage of shock. How many of your patients are in there with maybe respiratory failure and renal failure, bone mods, but don't have low blood pressure. Maybe they're responding to treatment. Well, they're in that progressive stage. We're not going to call them irreversible yet, but mods just means that more than two organ systems are in failure. 
So in irreversible stage, everyone is in mods, but you can be in mods without being in irreversible stage. Does that make sense? So multiple organ distress syndrome just, so just means that your multiple organ systems are in failure. So you have a renal failure patient that got fluid overloaded and is now a respiratory failure. Are they in MODS? Yes. Do they have a low blood pressure? No. What stage are they in? They are still in progressive. Because yes, they have decreased urine output. Yes, they've got hypoxia. They're in pulmonary edema, they're respiratory failure, but they're maintaining their blood pressure. So progressive. So we can term these things. It doesn't mean you're going to die of shock. It just means that we can rate their severity, basically. And the severity is whether their blood pressure is low or not. So you can be in MODS, in progressive, and in uh, irreversible. You can even be in MODS, in compensatory. Because what if you have a renal failure, liver failure patient? Boom. They already categorized for MODS. But if they're maintaining their oxygenation, their blood pressure will just be like, mm, okay. So you can see how we can call everyone in this world who's in the hospital some label, levels of stages of shock. But really what clarifies them as actual shock is their blood pressure being low. And then once their blood pressure is low, if it responds to our medical treatments, progressive stage. Once their blood pressure low does not respond to our medical treatments, irreversible stage. So don't, I won't, don't want you to just memorize MODS is only irreversible stage. It definitely is in the irreversible stage, but we can have MODS with anything. Okay, multiple organ distress syndrome just means you got multiple organ systems in failure. Could have it at any stage of shock. Okay. But I'm definitely putting it under irreversible stage because in irreversible stage, we definitely have multiple organ systems in shock or in failure. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're like, no, clear as mud. Let's walk through a couple more. What do we assess? What are your key assessments? The whole entire system. If we have decreased perfusion, we want to check each system and see how it's responding. What are we going to have if your neurosystem is not perfusing? Confusion, level of consciousness. You've studied all this. This is going over again again. What are we going to have if our respiratory system is not perfusion, getting perfusion? Hypoxia, signs and symptoms of hypoxia. Um, what do we get if your heart's not putting stuff out? Decreased perfusion, cyanotic skin, diminished pulses, port cap refill. Um, if we are not perfusing, this kind of goes with GI. Um, clotting goes with GI because clotting we usually put with the liver. If the liver starts to fail, we have issues with clotting. So I should probably put this with GI. Clotting goes down there with GI. Renal, if your renal system is failing, low urine output. If our GI system is failing, it's bowel sounds, blood sugar, and liver stuff. So I'm sure you've seen tons of people, and we are monitoring each system for getting better. Which system is our most important? our respiratory system. We want to make sure we're getting oxygen to our patient, and then we want to make sure that our heart is beating around, and we want to make sure that our brain is perfused. We kind of let these poor guys down here go. So I know I've, count, I've had a couple people that have clinicals, and we've been going through, and we're like, yeah, neuro, they're sedated, they're confused, they're not responsive, check. Respiratory, they're on a ventilator, check. Um, cardiac, oh, we're on vasopressors and fluids, check. Renal, oh, we're on CRRT, we're continuous renal replacement therapy, check. And liver, I don't know, those numbers are sky high, they're trying to feed them and they've had high residuals. Check, 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 we're all in the system. So what do you do to take care of this patient? So that's what we're going to talk about when we take care of these multiple organ failure patients. It's like, wow, everything's crap. What do we do now? That's the joy of the ICU. Um, here are some things that we will monitor to help us decide what stages we're in um, or what kind of shock we have. If we have, we'll look at blood cultures. What kind of shock will that tell us about? Septic shock. Um, what will serum lactate levels tell you? Acidosis and lactate production for any kind of shock. 
any kind. You can pull a lactate level for any kind of shock, for hypovolemic, for cardiogenic, for um, septic, for anything. Lactate just tells you if the tissues are getting enough oxygen or not. If the tissues are not getting enough oxygen, they will, they will make lactate. So a high lactate level means you have tissues in distress. Um, ABG, we'll read those to look at our respiratory system um, and whether our oxygenation is adequate or not. Um, continuous cardiac output, mo continuous cardiac monitoring, we're looking for that. That was a question on the test. Mm -hmm. How do we know decreased perfusion? One of the signs and symptoms of decreased perfusion. All the rest of them were great perfusion, and the only other one was dysrhythmias, because once the heart stops perfusing with oxygen very well, then things start getting irritable in the heart. So EKG changes, dysrhythmias are a sign that there's something not going wrong well with the heart. Continuous pulse ox, hemodynamic monitoring, um, and don't worry about the SVO2, but I will tell you one thing about the SVO2. This is called the mixed venous oxygen sap. They pull that from the vessel returning to the heart. So what do you need to get a mixed venous oxygen set? A central line. We'll pull it, venous blood from the central line, and match it to arterial blood. So we're sending out 90% oxygenated blood. What are we getting back? So we will look at what we're getting back to the heart. So we send out 90% oxygenated blood, and our SVO2, what we get back to the heart, we only usually use about 70, 25% of what we send out. So normally we send out 100% oxygenated and our SVO2 returning to the heart is about 75%. The body's not using a lot. But if we get, let's say we send out 100% oxygenated blood and we get back 60%. What's happening out there in the body? The body's using a lot of oxygen. So in infected states, if we do these measurements, we look, hey, we're sending out 100% oxygen. The body's sucking up 40% of it and sending back. Um, let's say we send out 90% oxygen and get back 30%. What's going on out in the body? The body's taking a lot of oxygen. So basically, when people are getting sick, they require more oxygen. Or when people have an infection, they require more oxygen. So we use this to just kind of see what's going on out in the body. We can't measure each little cell, and it's much easier to pull a lactate level. That'll tell us, too, the same thing. If the body's using a lot of oxygen, we can get, but if we're putting out enough oxygen, it could be using a lot of oxygen, and there's no lactate because we're supplying enough. The problem we start to see is when the SpO2 goes up, when we put out 100% oxygen and get back 90%. What does that mean out there in the body? It's just bypassing everything. It means a lot of cell death. If we're putting out oxygen and no one's using it, either you're completely healthy or everything's dead on the way around and you get back. So what we look for sometimes in septic patients or patients that are getting sicker is that if the SVO2 keeps going and going up and up. Just some background. I'm not gonna test you on SVO2, but that's how we use it. Some people will have SVO2 monitors on them and that's just so that we can keep an idea of what's going on. If the body is using 40% of what's sent out, and then it uses 45, and then it uses 50, we know their metabolism is going up and up and up. All right. So I'm not going to test you on that, but remember we did CVP. We knew that one. And this is just some slides going over a nice little summary slide of your cardiogenic shock. Here's what you see, and there's the treatments. You already studied that one, right? So you could skip that slide. You know that. Hypovolemic shock. This is just basically stop the blood, put fluids back. Anaphylactic shock. Oh, this kind of got a little messed up. That recent exposure to allergens is supposed to be up there. Um, what do we do to treat anaphylactic shock, just as a review from Block 4? Epi. Epi is the treatment. Airway, epi, and then um, like Benadryl, Solumedrol, something immunosuppressant, um, aggressive fluids. So that's just kind of a summary, just a reminder of how you treat anaphylactic. Neurogenic shock, just skip that slide because we're going to do it next week. Just skip it. And then septic shock is what we're going to spend our time on because septic shock has beautiful phases and they correlate with the phases that we see. Um, the first one is the initial phase where we just get infected. 
If you have a bloodstream infection, you may not see it yet. Okay, you've got some blood, you got some bacteria in your bloodstream, nothing, you don't see anything. That just means that you have it in your bloodstream, completely asymptomatic. How long people are in it depends on how aggressive the bacteria or virus is. So somebody with an aggressive virus will move right into the compensatory stage within like an hour or two. Someone with a very unaggressive virus or bacteria could be in septicemia for a couple of days before it starts to become apparent. Um, in the second stage, we end up with what's called the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And sepsis just means that you have a source of infection. So I had a, not to TMI, but after my first child, which I realize now was a horribly traumatic birth after listening to Katie's lecture, I was like, oh my goodness. After my first child, I had a um, hematoma that I started spiking a fever like a week after birth. And um, so I went into the doctor, and I was like, I just had a, I had a spiked fever. And he goes, yeah, we're going to admit you for IV antibiotics. And I was like, am I septic? And he's like, well, technically. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. That's <laughs> hormonal anyway. But um, you are considered septic if you, have a blood if you have bacteria in your bloodstream from any source. So, yeah, just because you're septic isn't like, oh, my God, you're in septic shock. It just means, yes, you have bacteria in your bloodstream. Sepsis just means bacteria in your bloodstream. You are very easily treated from sepsis. IV antibiotics, treat it and make it go away. Um, but yeah, I thought I was gonna die because I was an ICU nurse. And I'm like, oh my God, sepsis kills! I'm gonna die! And he's like, ah, crazy hormone thing. And then you your antibiotics and you're gonna be fine, and I won't. Um, but anyway, this is a good plan for syndrome. We have a slide for each one of these. Then you go into severe sepsis, which correlates to the progressive phase, and then you go into septic shock, which is the irreversible stage. So let's do a slide on each one of those. These you will need to know. The serve sepsis criteria. You will need to know these for the rest of your life, especially if you work in a hospital. They will quiz you on it. They'll make you carry cards around with it on there. You'll be getting sepsis alerts. You'll be dealing with this your whole entire life um, because it's very preventable and very treatable. We just have to recognize that something is going on and get them the proper treatment. So if you have a source of infection, so surgery, pneumonia, UTI, pre previous hematoma somewhere, any source of infection, any source of a bacteria, a cut, a scrape, a burn, any source of infection kind of is one of the criteria. And then if you have a fever, heart rate increase, hey, wait, aren't these the same as your compensatory mechanisms? Tachycardia, increased respiratory rate, and this one they add in a white blood cell count. Um, I'm going to add one more criteria on here. Oops, let me just go to this slide. I'm going to add one more criteria on here, or less than 4,000. Okay, so why do you think I just changed that? Because that's actually the true criteria. Sorry about not fixing that beforehand. Um, why? Why? This one's evident, right? Your white blood cell counts up because you got an infection, right? Why is it less than four is also a criteria for sepsis? They're all used up. They're all used up. I think we had a patient and a couple of patients that I'm like, oh, I need to relook at that criteria. Yes, less than four because all the white blood cells that you had were, are busy killing things and they are used up. So a low white blood cell count in along with a source of infection or a fever can also be considered sepsis, okay? So if you've had the flu, does this count? If you have a bad cold, does this count? Yes, technically you have SIRS. You can have SIRS with anything. It's a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Anytime your immune system is up, an autoimmune disease can give you SIRS. 
Many, many, many things can give you SIRS, but it is 100% seen with sepsis. If you have the flu, what is missing? You have this, you have this, you have this, you have this. What's missing to call it sepsis? You don't really have a source of infection yet. It's just a virus that's around. You could be going into the compensatory phase. What if this flu bug virus does get into your bloodstream? What's going to happen? You're going to get septic, but hopefully your white blood cells will take care of it. Flu viruses are very slow growing. They don't migrate very fast. Um, but if you have the flu, you will see the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. You may meet sepsis criteria. We have patients that are post-cardiac surgery that meet sepsis criteria because we've just cut open their chest, put them on a bypass machine, sets off the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So every single cardiac surgery patient meets sepsis criteria. And we have to call the cardiac surgeon. He's like, God damn, sepsis criteria. Patient's not septic. And I'm like, we have to let you know. Because you met SIRS criteria. But after every surgery, a big, huge, giant surgery, your patient will spike a fever and have an increased white blood cell count. Because it's fighting off whatever you just did in there. So it's very easy to meet these criteria. In fact, almost everybody at the hospital meets sepsis SIRS criteria. It's up to the doctor to say, we're on a, why do you think we cover people with prophylactic antibiotics? Because they meet these criteria. So most of your patients in the hospital will meet this criteria. You just need to let the doc know, and they will make sure they're properly covered. Um, what do you think we would do to treat a bloodstream infection or any kind of infection that is meeting SIRS criteria? Blood cultures to make sure, yes, it is or it is not in the bloodstream, and antibiotics. Ding, ding, ding. Notify the provider. This is a worsening condition. You're meeting sepsis criteria. And every hospital will set off sepsis alerts. You've probably gone through them on your, when you're looking at people's charts, and it pops up sepsis criteria, and you're just like, I don't know what to do with that. Let me close the window. <laughs> it pops up on almost everybody. Um, we do need to identify if there is an organism and where is it? So they will do blood cultures, speedo cultures, urine culture, wound cultures. If you have a patient that comes into the ER that meets sepsis criteria, which most patients do, what do you think you're going to get? Blood cultures, urine culture, speedo cultures, if they're spitting anything up. You're going to culture everything because we need to figure out what it is that's causing the SIRS. Um, if these are all negative, then great, we can pull you off antibiotics, but we're going to pull cultures and give IV antibiotics. So as soon as you meet SIRS criteria, you get antibiotics. When you go into someone with the flu and you say, hey, I have a flu virus, or I think I have a flu virus, what are they testing you for? You go into the ER and you're like, I have fever, tachycardia, hypoxia, I'm going into the ER, the urgent care. What are they going to do on you? Well, they're going to run a flu test. They're going to get rid of the quick causes, right? They run a rapid flu. If it comes back negative, you just bought yourself a workup. Because if they can call it the flu, then, okay, it's the flu. Go home, get over it in a week. Okay, it's strep. Don't you go to urgent care, and they'll just swab for all of the sources of infection, the most common things. If the most common things don't come up, then you're getting the full-on treatment because you're coming in with SIRS criteria. So now the next time you go into urgent care, type in the little thing, SIRS criteria. Well, you'll get a quick appointment. <laughs> but you do, whenever you are pretty ill, you meet SIRS criteria. I wish I could say that I did that. I was too sick to do that when I got the flu. Um, but they went and they ran a rapid flu. And it was flu positive, so they're like, we don't need to do the rest of the workups. Found the organism. Bing. But if there isn't a test for, you know, it's usually strep and flu are the big rapid organisms they can rule out. If they can't rule those out, then you get the full-on workup. And they'll have you pee in the cup. They might take blood cultures because you're meeting SIRS criteria. And or they may decide, eh, it's close enough. You got a UTI. We know what causes those. You got a kidney infection UTI. You're getting the antibiotics. The blood cultures aren't going to fix the problem. They help you identify the problem. 
If you come in with something and they can extrapolate the organism, then they just give you antibiotics. All right, how many times you got into urgent care and left with antibiotics? It doesn't matter. They're just gonna cover you with something broad spectrum. They don't wanna spend time getting the full workup. They're just gonna give you a Z-pack. It'll cover everything and let us know if it doesn't work. The treatment for sepsis is antibiotics. Any bacteria, no matter where it is, and especially if it's in the bloodstream, needs rapid antibiotics. Your white blood cell systems need help, and antibiotics is the help that they need. So if you are in the compensatory phase, meaning you have SERS criteria, you're getting antibiotics, unless you can prove it's a virus. Does that make sense? Does that see what they've all, any time you go to a doctor with fever, tachycardia, increased respiratory rate, you're getting antibiotics, unless they can be like, oh, you had a virus running around your house. But if they tell you, hey, well, we're gonna treat you for a virus, go home and medicate, and if this doesn't go away, come back and you get antibiotics. It's because they're treating you for any potential sepsis, because the goal is to get rid of it before it becomes past this compensatory stage. We never wanna see sepsis leave the compensatory stage, okay? Give them antibiotics, help the immune system out, and be done with it. You feel better in 24, 48 hours. And so that's really our goal on everybody that's potentially sepsis, is to get antibiotics into them and figure out what we're working on. Um, and the reason in the hospital we do all these special cultures and stuff is to make sure that we're treating the right organism. If it's something very mild, they'll just treat you with a Z-pack. But then they tell you, hey, if it doesn't get better, come back. You're getting further workup. So let's say you didn't go to the hospital and you didn't get your antibiotics or you were in the hospital and you didn't get noticed, your SERS criteria didn't pop up. Let's see what's gonna happen. So what's happening in this system? I don't know where my little, where's my car chase picture? Did I get rid of it? Oh, I had a great picture of the car chase going on. Let, um, I have a story like I did with DKA. Hang on, no, go back. Um, oh, here it is. This is kind of my car chase picture. This is what's happening. You get an infection from somewhere. You get a little rogue bacteria. Could come in from a cut, could come in from a burn, could come in from pneumonia, could come in from pyelonephritis, could come in from UTI. Anytime a bacteria has access to the bloodstream. What happens is once bacteria enters the blood, the white blood cells go after it. So it's like a big high-speed police chase going on in your blood vessels. So these bad guys, the bacteria, are running around, circulating around, and the white blood cells are grabbing them and eating them as they go around. The problem that happens is that as the white blood cells digest the bacteria, they unmedically poop out what we call cytokines. So the destruction products of the white blood cells eating bacteria. Basically, they release some dissolved bacteria, and they're called cytokines. And they are basically a signal from the white blood cell system to come and help. Come and help. It's what happens when you have a hangnail, and it starts to <coughs> swell. It's because there's been a white blood cell response there, and it's like, hey, come here and help. Come here and help. And so what happens is the vessels start to leak in response to these cytokines. So as the white blood cells are eating bacteria, they are pooping out these distress signals, saying, hey, I got one, I got one, come and help pull over here. But then the next moment, they're down in the feet. And it's like, hey, I got one down here, come help over here. And then it's up in the arm, and it's saying, hey, I got one over here, I got one. So it's basically these white blood cells are chasing bacteria around the body, and everywhere it grabs the bacteria, it sends out this distress signal, these cytokines, to come and help. And so these cytokines bind on to your vessels and they leak because why do vessels leak when the immune system asks for it? It lets white blood vessels and all these repair things, it lets everything out of the bloodstream to the site of the infection. That's why we have swelling. Every single immune response comes with swelling because the vessels around that area leak. So we have pneumonia. It sends out and binds all these cytokines and then this whole area leaks to allow other white blood cells and other helpers to get there. And that creates a little bit of swelling. Well, now this is happening all over the body. 
not just in a localized area. Because it's in the bloodstream, this is happening all over the body. So we're not just leaking around our infection in our lungs. We're not just leaking around a cut in our skin. We're not just leaking around, you know, a surgery site. Why do you think surgery sites swell? It's just a normal response to these cytokines. But now this is happening throughout our body. So cytokines cause <coughs> leaking blood vessels, and they also cause blood vessel dilation. So what's happening with this sepsis is bacteria enter the blood, white blood cells are kind of sending out this distress signal all over the body, and blood cells all over your body are leaking and dilating. We can't do anything about it because while this immune reaction is happening, this is what's happening. So throughout your body, you have leaking blood vessels and dilating blood vessels. What do you think that is going to lead to? a low blood pressure because we're leaking everything out and vasodilating, meaning that your blood pressure is widening and it's gonna take more fluid to fill it, which is leaking out. So septic patients, if it goes very far, end up becoming edematous and hypotensive. So if you've taken care of any septic patients in the ICU, they are puffy. It's because they have whole body vasodilation. Um, Oh, that's chocolate. It was after this. I missed it somehow. So that's my little car chase story. So this is the sound, this is the signs of this car chase beginning. All of these cytokines now start creating a fever response. Like, help, I need more help, I need more help. Well, it's gonna up your temperature to try and kill bacteria. Why does your heart rate go up? It's trying to pump fluid through these dilating cells. These dilating vessels, sorry, these vessels are dilating. The cytokines are binding, they're leaking, and they're dilating, and so the heart's trying to provide. Why does your respiratory rate go up? You need oxygen. There's a lot of fighting going on. There's a full-on war going on in your body. Lots of oxygen needed, so we're trying to provide all that. And then, of course, our white said blood cell production is going up and up and up, trying to fight all this. But if this gets out of control too quickly, we can use up all of our white blood cells before we can make more. It takes a day or so to make more. So um, let's talk about now we're seeing into the progressive stage. This has been going on for a couple of hours or a couple of days now. And what is happening to our blood vessels? Leaking and dilating, right? So we continue to see our SIRS criteria. And wherever I put greater than 12, let's put less than 4, too. I want you to remember that piece. Greater than 12. I don't want anybody to be like, it wasn't on that slide. Or less. <laughs> I don't know. I And do, you know, call me out if you see something on these slides that don't make sense. I write these slides like I talk. And um, sometimes I don't make sense because I'm talking too fast or I'm thinking too fast. Oh, where'd it go? Okay. So we're going to see the same service criteria, but now we've got vasodilation, low blood pressure, and signs of ineffective tissue perfusion because we're now leaking fluid rather than delivering stuff out to the body. Why do we see a lactate level going up? Yeah, the cells are asking for more oxygenation that we can give them. Sometimes we give them 100% oxygen and the cells need more than that because they're in such a high demand state. Um, so now that we're in a progressive stage, these things are starting to get out of control. Your heart rate might be higher, your respiratory rate might be higher. Now you've got some hypotension. And what did I tell you the difference between the progressive and the irreversible stages? They respond to our treatments. So we have a hypotensive patient. So we get a CRT from the floor. Beep, beep, beep. CRT, room 403. And we go to room 403, and they're like, my blood pressure is 88 over 60. I've taken it twice. Doctor won't call me back. What do you think I'm going to order for this patient? Blood cultures, sputum cultures, urine cultures, ABG, a lactate. Because we want to see is this low blood pressure due to sepsis? We're going to ask, is there a source of infection? Oh, yeah, they had surgery two days ago. Okay, you're probably meeting sepsis criteria. 
of course, will go through, hey, their blood pressure is low, but I bet their heart rate's high, I bet their respiratory rate's high, I bet they're on oxygen. So we get a set of labs to see how far we are. But we're probably in this progressive stage. So what do you think we're going to do to treat this patient? The patient that's had, we're going to get a bunch of labs to look at it, but we need to treat this patient too. And we're saying, oh, you've got a source of infection, you've got increased heart rate, you've got a low blood pressure. I'm going to treat you with sepsis. So what do you think the orders would be to treat this patient? Hmm? Well, antibiotics, if they're not already on them, hopefully we can get those going. What else? Fluids. Let's do fluids. What has happened to this patient to get them to this state? They've leaked a ton of stuff out, and their veins are dilated. So if this heart is working hard to try and fill these big sewer pipes that we got, let's put some fluid in them. So in this stage, we now add fluid to the picture in addition to antibiotics and looking at the organism. So we're going to draw a bunch of labs. We're going to fig figure out where we are in this cycle, but we're pretty much in the progressive stage. And so you've just treated sepsis. You've given a fluid bolus. So they've already called the doc. The doc hasn't called back yet. But what we're going to do in the meantime is treat this low blood pressure with fluids. We're going to give them, and this is a standard for sepsis care, I don't get to make these orders up, they're already written for me. Anytime I walk into a room, a CRT with a patient that has potential sepsis, we're getting blood cultures, we, we don't give antibiotics, sorry, we don't pick antibiotics. We give blood cultures, ABG, lactate level to see where we are in the spectrum, and we're allowed to give fluid. We cannot give antibiotics because that depends on a physician to call back. So I cannot give you an order for antibiotics if you don't have them already. But we can identify the organism and give the fluid bolus. And then the, hopefully the docs call back and we're going to get some antibiotics on. Sometimes they're already on prophylactic antibiotics. Maybe it's not the right one. Maybe it's not a high enough dose. The physician has to decide the antibiotic dose. But fluids, 30 milligrams per kilogram is a standard. So let's say we are 100 kilos. It's about 200 pound guy, 220 pound guy, 100 kilo patient, how much fluid is he getting? 3,000, 3 liters, and yes, that's okay. If you think they're septic, we need to fill their tanks, and one of the biggest things that we find is septic patients are under-resuscitated. So if you are an 80 kilo, meaning about 160, 180 count person, how much fluid are you getting? 2,400. So we'll order at least two liters to start with. If we are catching this in the progressive stage, what will happen after we give fluids? The blood pressure will return. Okay. Then, if the blood pressure does not return, we will classify it as an intermediate stage. Okay. That's really what we're doing is when you call with a low blood pressure patient who's septic, hopefully... These patients were identified at the first SERS criteria. They got antibiotics, but maybe they're just falling down this path. Maybe the antibiotics didn't come soon enough. Maybe they weren't high enough dose. Um, but now this patient's got low blood pressure. So we'll give them their 30 milliliters per kilogram. And if they don't respond to it, they're in the irreversible stage. What do you think now we're going to do for this patient? This patient did not respond to a fluid bolus. So we're going to call this persistent hypertension, hypotension, persistent hypotension. They were 88 over 60. They called the CRT. We gave them two liters of fluid over the next hour, got the lab results back, and the blood pressure still not improved. What do you think they're going to get next? They're going to the ICU. Now you get your patient into the ICU, um, and they are going to get, sorry, this is just more, this is, Here's the actual um, treatment for when you're going to call it irreversible. That is where you have a patient that's blood pressure does not respond to the fluids or is not responding to your antibiotics. Maybe they need two or three different kinds of antibiotics. Maybe they need an antifungal. Maybe they need something. But they're not responding to our medical treatment in the progressive phase, which is fluid and antibiotics. Okay? They are not responding, so we need to do... Maybe this patient on the floor is also becoming hypoxic. Don't you think that a patient that's getting more and more septic may not just have low blood pressure, they might have hypoxia too? 
they're going to be multiple fluid system, they're multiple systems in failure because they're not getting what they need. So when you go to the ICU, this is what you end up doing in the ICU. When you send a septic patient to the ICU, you might do some of this on the floor if you're taking care of a septic patient on the floor. A lot of patients on the floor qualify as septic. They're getting antibiotics and they're getting their, their pneumonia patient, the COPD exacerbation that has pneumonia. What are they getting? Antibiotics, oxygen, BiPAP. We're trying to support their system while they're in this compensatory phase. It's going to happen because they're sick. They're in a compensatory phase, and if we don't get them what they need, or this infection runs out of control before we can get them what they need, or the infection runs out of control without even to pace them what we need, then they're moving into progressive and irreversible. So when they come to the ICU, we will continue to fix their hypoxia to the point of if we need to put in an ET tube and ventilate them, we will. But we go through the steps of respiratory failure. They get higher and higher oxygen, they go to BiPAP or CPAP, and then they get intubated, depending on their APGs. Then we will give them, we will continue to give them fluids because this leaking is not gonna stop while this is happening. If they are septic, their vessels will be leaking and they will be vasodilated. So we will give them fluids and albumin and if it's not responding to that, then we will go with inotropes and vasopressors. We will help the heart pump whatever fluid it has and we will give them vasopressors, levofed, epi, norinaprobin, anything to help constrict and stop that leaking and stop that vasodilation. Then we will continue to treat the infection. We will support their nutrition. Do you think if they have that high oxygen needs, they have high nutrition needs too, right? These patients are sick. We can't just give them oxygen. They need food. They need food. So most ICU patients end up on some kind of tube feeding or nutritional support because they need help. They need eating. They need to, this is, you know, starve a cold, feed a fever. We need food to fix them. Um, and then we will do other things for failing organs. Does that make sense? This is septic, a bloodstream infection. How do we know we have a bloodstream infection? Blood cultures. If your blood cultures come back negative, then you don't have a bloodstream infection. If your blood pressures come back positive, you have a bloodstream infection. They won't know until they do blood cultures. And so every patient with SIRS or sepsis criteria probably do end up with blood cultures somewhere along the line, unless they can treat and the organism gets better. If you never move past that compensatory phase, then you're fine. And we do leave septic patients on the floor because if they're getting all the treatments and they're responding to the treatments, then great, you're taking care of them. We only move them to higher levels of care if they're moving into progressive or irreversible stage. Does that make sense? Because this is what happens in the hospital all the time. Septic patients, it just happens. So here I am at the doctor crying, am I septic? And he's like, well, technically, yeah, you spiked a fever and you have a source of infection and your heart rate's up and your respiratory rate's up. So we're gonna admit you, give you IV antibiotics and we'll take it from there. Calm down, lady, is what he was trying to tell me to do. Calm down, because yes, I'm gonna treat it. And sure enough, after 24 hours of antibiotics, heart rate went down, fever went down, respiratory rate went down, infections under control, never move past compensatory. And that's our goal for patients, don't move past compensatory. But progressive and um, irreversible, sometimes patients do. Maybe they get missed, maybe they don't get antibiotics started on time, there could be a crazy infection. And then all of a sudden, now we're moving them upstairs because they've moved into this irreversible phase. It really depends on your antibiotic. Things like E. coli in the bloodstream move super fast. And here's a patient that's in the progressive stage, or the irreversible stage. This is everything. Have you taken care of a patient that looks like that? This is a rotoprone bed. So what do they have if they have the rotoprone bed? Ards. Ards. And Ards does come from severe sepsis, because guess what? Leaky blood vessels, your lungs are leaky. So if your lungs start leaking, you'll end up in ARDS. So ARDS does come from severe sepsis and, and irreversible sepsis. Rotoprone bed, what is this one? CRRT. The CRRT machine, this is a dialysis 
And why do we do continuous dialysis at the bedside rather than just a regular hemodialysis machine? They're too unstable. Their blood pressure can't handle us pulling two, three liters off in a three hour period. So they have to take teeny tiny bits, like 50 cc's an hour off, and do it slowly. So this patient's in ARDS um, on CRRT, um, obviously has some chest tubes here, don't know if they had heart surgery, they might have pneumothoraces, they might have something going on, they may have blown something within there. Got actually not that many pumps going on, there might be some more behind the bed. Tube feeding. So, I mean, basically, we're just supporting all the systems, and that's what I tell families when we're doing, and I'm like, well, the brain, we're letting them rest so they can recover. Okay, we sedate them because they're on the tube. Uh, respiratory, we're on a ventilator. Cardiac-wise, we're doing a bunch of meds to do the job of the heart. We're trying to squeeze the heart. We're trying to vasoconstrict things. We're trying to keep your pulses up. We're trying to keep perfusion going. GI-wise, we're feeding you. We're trying to make sure that everything keeps moving through there and you're supplying food. We are doing renal replacement. We can replace every organ outside the body except the liver. The livers and the brain are the two organs we haven't come up with a machine for yet. Otherwise, we got something for everything. So, um, yeah, we'll just sit there and support everything and let hopefully the body will return. So that's the end of sepsis. Ta-da, ta-da!